thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. Thank you so much for your word. Father, and thank you so much for the fellowship that we have one with another. Father, I pray that you would continue to move in our midst, lead us and guide us, grow us. Father, thank you for uh, another day, another opportunity to come together and serve you, to worship you, to uh, be active in this community for you. We love you and we praise you, Father. Lead us and guide us during this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, uh, we're going to talk about again um, the formation of the New Testament, why we believe the Bible, the Protestant New Testament, um, why we don't embrace or accept or acknowledge uh, these other scriptures as valid. Okay? I'm going to read a quick excerpt from The Case for Christ. Uh, Lee Strobel, you've heard of him. Hi, guys, welcome. Come on in. This is a case, and he, he does like a case for Christ, case for Christmas, case, case for the resurrection, case for... Uh, Lee Strobel was a, um, a journalist, a, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, research, uh, golly. It was a journalist, but a specific kind of journalist, where he was researching, um, getting to the root of the story. Uh, a detective, what's another word? investigative journalism that's what he was there we go I got her thank you Mrs. Darter <laughs> um, investigative journalist and his inquiry into the things of Christ um, if you're not familiar with his his journey his story it was very powerful very amazing they made a movie on it it's called the case for Christ the the, the story by Lee Strobel who's still alive today um, and he shares his story, his journey to Christ, to Christianity. Here he's growing up in the 70s and, and just living life that they lived in the 70s. And uh, just the culture, the, the drugs, the free love, the et cetera, et cetera. Him and his wife come together. Long story short, she becomes a Christian. He disdains Christ because he sees Christ as another man moving in on his woman. And he doesn't appreciate this, but it's not another man. It's an organization, a church. It's a religious group. It's a belief system. And some dead guy, 2,000 years old, dead, and yet he's still making his moves on my wife. So he had some serious, um, serious things that he didn't approve of concerning religion and Christ. Um, she started attending church, getting involved in the church and worship. Her life was changing, uh, no longer partying. He didn't approve. He, he felt like he was losing his spouse, and he loved her. And so jealous as he was, he decided, I'm going to go after this other man, Christ. And one of his coworkers was um, a Christian. And he said, listen, buddy, if you want to dismantle Christianity, just go for the throat you know, go for the resurrection. You disprove the resurrection, you've disclaimed all of Christianity. All of Christianity comes falling. So he set about, in many years, he was investigating the claims of Christ and targeting specifically the resurrection. But you have to kind of understand why the resurrection to, you know, dismantle it. And so he went about this. And uh, in the long process, over years, he actually came to faith in Christ. And he, his own story, his own testimony says that he came to a conclusion that he did not like. He said, I, my back's up against the wall because I'm finding that all of the evidence points to that Jesus was real and that he really resurrected from the dead. But I don't like that because this is the same guy that's moving in on my family. And so, with reservation... After a long internal struggles, he actually kneeled to the cross of Christ and he prayed and he accepted Jesus. And then he saw what a life transforming, changing event that Christ is. So here he is years later using his same skills acquired in the world to tear apart stories, to investigate, to, to ridicule and get to the truth and the bottom of it. And here he's coming against not just Christ, but um, everything, Christianity, the Bible in particular. 
and he does some very informative investigative journalism concerning the scriptures that are very relevant for us today to understand the scriptures today. Now, if you're studying the scriptures um, outside of the scriptures themselves, you're looking at like, like we've kind of been doing, we look at who wrote Acts, you know, things like that. We're asking these questions. Who is James? You know, who's James the pastor that's in Jerusalem? Did he write a, a letter to the church? And the answers are yes, right? Who wrote the book of Acts, guys? You guys are staring at me like, wait a minute, hold on. The book of Acts, Paul was a guess. The former account I made, O Theophilus. Luke, good job, Luke. Luke wrote the book of Acts. Luke, was he one of the 12 disciples? No, he was not one of the 12. Um, three, or excuse me, six of the boys of the 12. This is a quick way to remember which of the, you know, how many. Quick, can you name all 12 of the disciples? No, <laughs> I can't. Can you? You know, um, Six of the boys, two of them had similar names, and two of them had similar names, and two of them had similar names. So if you can do three names, you've got halfway there, okay? So Simon, there's two boys named Simon. One of them is Simon Peter, we're very familiar with. There was Simon, another Simon. There's also two Judases. That's fun, right? Uh, so there's four down. <laughs> four of 12, we're third of the way there. Okay, and then, golly, now I can't remember. Uh, Bartholomew and Matthew, that's, uh, those aren't the same. Oh, it's James and James. Okay, there was two James. James the lesser and uh, uh, James the brother of John. Okay, so there's James, James, Simon, Simon, Judas, Judas, Bartholomew, Matthew. Uh, yeah, I believe Andrew and Thomas. Okay, so at any rate. We're almost there. We're almost there. Point is, uh, Luke was not a disciple. So this is something that you, you need to learn from the scriptures, but sometimes it's not very clear. Like, who wrote the book of Acts? Luke wrote the book of Acts. But, but who is James? Because there's Peter, James, and John, the inner three. And the problem is, the James that's mentioned in the book of Acts was James, the brother of Jesus, not a disciple of Jesus. He's later the pastor in Jerusalem. He's Peter's pastor. Wait a minute, he wasn't a disciple. You're right. What happened to the other James? Herod killed him. He beheaded him. And this is pretty much right out the gate in, in the Christian church. So there's questions that we don't think to ask. That this, what we're talking about in discipleship... Why do we reject some of these scriptures? And why do we embrace the Protestant Bible? These questions need to be asked and addressed. Like, for instance, okay, not just who wrote it, but when was it written? This is very key to our understanding. Why do we, why do we wholeheartedly reject the Gospel of Thomas? Not only is it just straight up false doctrine, it's screwy, screwy stuff. That's the one that Jesus is talking to Peter, allegedly. And Peter says, rebuke Mary, tell her to go away from us. She's not with us. She's not a guy. And Jesus is like, you need to pray for her so that she'll become a guy. Remember that one? Remember us reading that? You guys are looking at me like you haven't been listening. We've talked about this for several times. This is like insanity, right? Do you find that anywhere else in the scriptures? No. But let's ask a question. Who wrote it? It's allegedly the gospel of Thomas. So allegedly Thomas wrote it. So now let's, let's ask another question. When was it written? This is a very important question because Thomas died in India as a martyr. But it was several years, not just years, but decades, not just decades, but kind of like centuries. Then it appeared. When did the Gospel of Thomas show up on the scene? Like 250 years 
250 AD, so that would be 220 years after Christ's death. And 200 years after Thomas's death. These are some of those investigative journalism kind of things that we need to ask. Some things that we need to understand. Why do we wholeheartedly reject it? Well, it claims to be of Thomas. Is it of Thomas? Well, it claims to be. Is the doctrine lining up? No. But when did it come out? These are kind of important. One of the allegations against Christianity today is when the Bible was written was many, many years. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, we're done there. Let's move on. Okay. Everybody's staring like a fly or a moth to a flame or a fly to a (laughs) bug zapper. It's just a TV screen, guys. Don't worry. It's not going to get you. (laughs) All right. These, these, these questions of when were, when were the, the books written? A claim is that when Jesus lived his life and the apostles are coming together, they're becoming a group, they're becoming the disciples, later the apostles, okay? Jesus lived his life and we know very publicly from public record, public execution, that Jesus died on the cross, And the entire Jewish nation was, there was an upheaval and an upset. There was for, there was against. Are we clear? This is without debate. What becomes of a debate is whether or not he rose from the dead. Now, the Christian church, here we are thousands of years later, almost 2,000 years later, we're saying and believing that Jesus rose from the dead. Hello? Hello? Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, he rose from the dead. We believe this. Matter of fact, all of Christianity hinges on that one fact. People are claiming against your faith, against my faith, that when the apostles decided to write these things down, it was so long after the fact that, like Jesus being a really cool guy, they made the fish a little bit bigger. Kind of a thing, right? You guys know what I'm talking about? Good fish story. You caught it. It was a good nine inches. And you take it home and you filleted it and you ate it and it was delicious. And you're telling your buddy about it the next day. It was a good 12 inches. It got a little bit bigger. And then before you know it, a week later, a month later, you know, oh, I should have went in and, to, you know, to weighed it and measured it. And because I could have got the, the 20 inch fish price, right? Or whatever the case would be. Before you know it, a lifetime later, we're talking 10 years, 20 years later. You guys, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Anybody ever play high school sports? Right? And isn't it true that you used to be so much faster than your actual time was? (laughs) Sure, sure. Irrelevant to what we're talking about. Let's let's come back to this. Anybody ever like play high school sports or, or the volleyball team or whatever? You played an instrument, you did art, whatever the case was. You look back and say, wow, those were the good old days. And your memory of those days is tainted based upon your bias toward yourself. And you're thinking, I used to be so much faster. I used to jump so much higher. I used to play so much harder. If only I had that kind of energy today. It was so good then, when in reality, back then, it was only this, but your memory is, it was this, right? Your perspective has changed. Why? It's not that the facts changed, it's because the way that you want to remember it is fondly. So the allegation is, because this is human tendency, that the allegation is that the disciples did the exact same thing. That's the allegation. They're saying Jesus actually didn't do the miracles that they said that he did. They only wanted him to look better than he actually did. They're saying that Jesus did miracles, but in reality, it was so long after the fact that people forgot. Who, now, who was Lazarus? Did he raise? No, he was just sick in bed, yo. Well, he was dead in the tomb for four days. No, that's the story. Wink, wink. But what was actually going on is he was sick in bed for four days. Does that make sense? So they're, 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 they're alleging that the disciples were exaggerating 
the facts. And the only way that that could be true is if, well, the people around couldn't verify either true or false. And how could that be true is if so much time had elapsed from when they actually told the story clear back to the time that it actually took place. There was so much time in between that it was not no longer credible. So therefore, the miracles that Jesus did are only alleged miracles. Now, this really kind of bothers us as Christians because if Jesus is only purported to do miracles but actually did none, then why are we following him? And that's the world the world's saying, that's right. Why are you following him? And we're like, well, we don't know. We, we, our Bible said so. Well, your Bible was written so long after the fact. Okay, that's a good one. There are multiple accounts. The gospel accounts, there's four different accounts, four different authors giving four different perspectives. Incidentally, none of them are in contradictory to each other. Now, the multiple accounts is a big deal. But what's even a bigger deal is how soon from when the events actually took place to when the disciples said and spoke about it and shared about it. Okay? In ancient history... When a document, when something happened, and in ancient history, when it was talked about, there was such a huge gap in time. One of the oldest books outside of the Bible in existence today, anybody want to take a guess? Homer's Iliad. Homer's Iliad. Okay. And it's called also the Odyssey. You've seen the movies. You know about the Greek god, the Trojan horse? You, you, everybody heard about the Trojan horse? Like, Pastor, we're not supposed to be talking about that kind of stuff in church, right? No, no, not that. We're talking about the actual, the horse that they, the Troy, the, the, you guys remember, that they built inside. They took their ships apart. They built a horse right there. They couldn't siege the, the, the city. So... They made this horse, and all the soldiers were inside, and they didn't know it, and so they left, they abandoned, and the, the, the Greek people thought, well, hey, they left us an offering. And so they brought it inside the gates, and they're all celebrating, woohoo, woohoo, didn't even have to fight. And at night, all the soldiers came out, and they were able to seize and capture the city. You guys remember the story of, uh, uh, oh... At any rate, a lot of Greek mythology. Um, golly, what's that guy? They made lo they've made lots of movies. Uh, what's that? Hercules. Same concept. Uh, same thoughts. It's Greek mythology. Um, Jason and the Argonauts. You know, the big old metal being whatever. This is from Homer's Iliad. Now, nobody with a logical thinking mind would embrace this as true. They would say, yes, these these things were purported to be true. And the accuracy of what was being purported is we, we, we embrace it. We don't say that it was true, but we say that they accurately recorded or copied the original stories. Homer's Iliad, incidentally, the closest copy from when it was done to when it was recorded is a 1,500-year time frame. And historians don't have a problem with Homer's Iliad. So what about the New Testament? Well, if Jesus died, let's say for simplicity, um, if Jesus was born at zero, okay, B.C. 3, 2, 1, 0, and then A.D. 1, 2, 3, fast forward 2,200 or 2,022 years, we have 2020, right? 2022. All right, um, so if he was born at zero, his ministry began at what? The Bible records, Pastor Steve reminded us, he began at 30 years old. So the date would have been, let's say, 30. When did he die? 
33. When was Jerusalem sacked, destroyed? A.D. 70. Okay, so what's the time frame from when Jesus was on the cross till Jerusalem being destroyed? 30, 37 years, thereabouts. Okay, now that's assuming that Jesus was born at zero. Um, we're, we could go a couple years either side, but that's as close historically as we can get um, in logic. So, if that's the case, when, at 33, when did the disciples start their writings? Who was the first person to write? Was it Peter? Was it Mark? It was Matthew. Matthew's the first one, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. Is that the, no. They start with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in that order. Why? Because it tells the story of Jesus. It does you no good to tell you the story of Paul in the epistles or the Acts of the Apostles without understanding why was Paul motivated? What was he doing? Who was he preaching? Like, okay, who's Jesus? This doesn't make any sense. So you start with the story of Jesus. Why does it start with the story of Matthew in our Bibles? Incidentally, because the first crowd was Jews. The first people they were trying to communicate to. Well, what was Matthew? Why was he trying to communicate? His gospel was targeted toward the Jews. Does this make sense? And then Mark, he was a disciple of Peter. He wrote his gospel, and it was targeting not just Jews, but Jews of farther away lands, but also starting to trickle into the Gentiles. Luke, who was he? He was a physician. He was a doctor. Why did he write? It was just not, it was to the Greeks and to the Gentiles. And then John, it's for everybody. Okay? So that's why that order. But who wrote first? That's the question. The answer is, ding, 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 Paul. Paul the Apostle. So now the question is, when did he write? We know what he wrote. We have the scriptures. We know what he wrote. When did he write it? Again, coming back to Jesus, allegedly did some stuff, said some stuff, went to the cross, died on the cross, rose from the grave, 40 days later, uh, or 50, 40 days later, ascended to heaven, 10 days later, birth of the church, Pentecost, some years later, you have the first Christian writings appearing. The gap between here and there is what we're bringing into question today. All right? When were they written? Now, thank you, God, for people like Lee Strobel, who's done the research. I'd like to read to you an excerpt from, it's an audio book. I don't have the book. I have the audio version. So this is me taking notes because this is incredibly relevant and incredibly fascinating to me. The origins of the belief in Jesus. Now, the world is trying to tell us that Jesus was just a guy. The disciples basically put a cape on him. They made him super guy. Okay? Jesus did a few things, slipped somebody in Advil. They got cured of a headache. The disciples didn't see it. They're like, woo, Jesus cured miraculously somebody from a headache. They're saying these things. And then here we are a couple thousand years later going, wow, Jesus even walked on water. He rose from the dead. All the miracles, okay? And, and the world is going, you guys are gullible idiots. But are we gullible idiots? Are we deceived? No. How do we know? Because of when it was said. When the story was communicated. When it was said. So the origins in the belief of Jesus, specifically that he was the son of God. Not years later, he was a cool guy. Then before you know it, he was a really cool guy. Before you know it, wow, he even did miracles. Before you know it, wow, he not only did miracles, but <gasps> he was like God-like. And then before you know it, wait, what did you say? He's God? And so years later, he's now the son of God when before he never presented himself that way. Is that, that's what people are saying. Is that what's true? The answer is no. But can you back it up? The answer is, these guys lived during the same lifetime as Jesus. Their lives overlapped. So their writings 
if they showed up like gospel of Thomas did 200 something years later well yeah that's a big fish story it got this big but if they were actually there and within a year or two or three or five or ten even wrote about that and I was there Jay was there Evan was there and I said listen man this is what happened and I give a, a, an account that's a little bit outside the parameters of truth can we say Pastors call it hyperbole. The world calls it exaggeration. Like when pastors are going to report a number, you know, they're like, hey, we're starting a new church work. You know what I'm saying? And they're like, wow, how many people you got going to your church? He's like, six of us. And they're like, really? That's so awesome. Yeah, we got me and my wife and my kid. And then there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There are six of us going. Yeah, no, that's kind of exaggerating a little bit, right? We're talking about human souls. Okay, let's limit it. Oh, just three. But your family, those don't count. <laughs> okay, so really nobody's going to your church. <laughs> okay. Well, at any rate, this is the same concept. If I'm there, Jay's there, Evan's there, and I'm exaggerating, and yet we're telling people we need to be telling the truth, isn't it true that they're going to hold me to an account that says, hey, buddy, you need, to, you need to pull down that Facebook post because that's not true. That's not what really happened. You need to, you know, hey, you're telling people to walk with integrity, but yet you're lying right to their face. You're a hypocrite. You need to tear it down. Right? That's pure accountability. That's very important. When the disciples wrote it, there were so many people alive that could verify or deny. And the kicker is, Everybody verified it. And not just the in crowd, but people who were hostile toward the church. The Roman centurions, hello? Um, Pilate, he didn't want to send Jesus to the cross. He was advocating to him, but he finally like, fine, whatever, peer pressure, go on, do it. Right? So these were hostile eyewitnesses. The Jewish people... The, the, the leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were hostile eyewitnesses, meaning they acknowledged Jesus as a person, but they denounced that he was the son of God. He den they denounced that he's the king, the savior, right? The Lord. Are you with me? And so, incidentally, none of them, the hostile eyewitnesses, disproved the resurrection account. Matter of fact, they started to make up lies because they could not prove. When the disciples came out and said, hey, listen, uh, Jesus rose from the dead. What's the quickest, easiest way to find out? All right, let's go to the tomb. Let's find out. And if his body was there, they could have pulled him out and said, you liars. You guys are evil people. But they couldn't. Well, what if all them guys died and later on the books came out? That's the allegation that is being leveled at the church. It was so long after the fact that everybody who could say yay or nay was now longer, no longer a part of the scene. Right? That's the allegation. But is that true? That's what we need to find out. So I'm going to read this excerpt. Are you guys ready? Uh, excerpt from The Case for Christ or excuse me, The Case for Christmas by Lee Strobel. <clears throat> and this is just my notes from listening to the audio uh, version. It says, Origins of the Belief in Jesus. Can we reasonably reconstruct ancient history from other or outside sources? How far from the events to when they were written down? A guy named Armstrong said in a book called A History of God says, we know very little about Jesus. The first full-length account of his life was St. Mark's Gospel, which was not written until about, uh, until about the year AD 70. That would be some 40 years after his death. By that time, historical facts had been overlaid with mythical elements which expressed the meaning Jesus acquired for his followers in 
It is this meaning that St. Mark primarily conveys rather than a reliable, straightforward portrayal. In other words, Mark was lying about the miracles. He was just trying to get the teachings across to you. But to get you hooked on the teachings, he told you that this is like following Superman. Okay? That's what this scholar is saying. Is that true? No, we don't accept that as true. Some scholars and skeptics say that they were written so long after the events that legend developed and distorted what was finally written down, turning Jesus from a wise teacher into a mythological son of God. Or is there evidence to the contrary? The standard scholarly dating of the Gospels in a liberal loose circles is Mark written in the 70s, Matthew and Luke in the 80s, John, the Gospel of John in the 90s. But that is still in the lifetime of various eyewitnesses and even hostile eyewitnesses who would have served as a corrective if false teachers would have risen. In other words, if, if Jesus died in 33, in the 30s, and Mark's gospel, the closest one, was 70s, that's 40 years. That means there's still people alive that could have said, if I told you today that China flew airplanes into the Twin Towers on September 12th, 2001, 2001, what would your response be? Billy had it exactly right. You'd laugh. You'd look at me with scoff or disdain, knowing, dude, your facts are wrong. It was September 11th, 2001, and it was the Taliban, you idiot. We actually have footage, right? So my story would not even make it out the door because my facts were wrong and nobody would run with it. Because there's too many people alive today that remember that day. That changed everything that day here in America, right? There are too many people still alive from World War II that say, no, the, the Holocaust was real. But yet history books today are trying to tell us, no, that was just, it was a misunderstanding. The Jews weren't persecuted. Uh, excuse me. Grandma, great-grandma, and even I can remember some stuff, okay? You're talking to people 70 and 80 years old who, who fled. So, the guy that we went with, that we brought with us to the, the convention yesterday was German and was alive for the Dresden bombing. So he can tell us and, and, and tell us about stories that happened. Why? Because they were alive. Crazy stuff. All right, so this is the allegation. Does this start to make sense? All this rant that Pastor Jimmy's been doing. I'm trying to communicate something to you. It's when these books were written. Okay? The, the standard acceptable dates by most scholars, generally speaking, the earliest, the first one uh, of the gospel accounts, was, was Mark in the 70s, uh, Matthew and Luke in the 80s, and John in the 90s. Okay, but the problem is with this allegation, these things happen so far after that they're, they're lost to, to the fish got bigger. You know, legend developed into now he's a massive, amazing son of God, when in reality he wasn't all that. This is their critics. This is what critics are leveling against Christianity. But the problem with this criticism, and I'm trying to, to tell you, the problem with this allegation is that it still happened during the lifetime of people that could say, BS, <laughs> nonsense, horse crud, okay? Um, this is not true. What happened, happened. And there were so many people still alive that could say, yay or nay. We're only talking 40 years, Okay. <clears throat> I, I need to hurry. Uh, that is still in the lifetime of various eyewitnesses and even hostile eyewitnesses who would have served as a corrective if false teaching would have arisen. 
all things considered, these later dates are not that late at all. Compared to the two earliest biographies of Alexander the Great, written by Arian and Plutarch more than 400 years after the events and his death, 400 years. Alexander the Great, his biography shows up. 400 years. Uh, his death in 323 B.C., yet they are considered to be generally trustworthy by historians. 400-year gap, and they're saying that, that account must have been true. That's not very fair here. Legendary material did develop over time, but only in the centuries that followed. The first 500 years, the story's integrity was kept intact. Legend developed in the next 500 years about Alexander the Great. So compare that to the Gospels, which were written anywhere from 30 to 60 years after the life of Jesus, is not even adequate and valid as a point. In other words, you're going to accept 400-year gap and tell us that those stories were true, but yet we have a 30-year-old, 30 to 60-year gap? And you're telling us that our story's not true? No, that's, that isn't even fair. That's not even correct. Let's think this through, guys. Let's be honest. Um, it is not negligible and not even an issue. The shortest gap between the event and the, and the, the, the event, excuse me, the event and the writings the less likely it would be prone to legend or faulty memory. The gospel date dating, could it be written sooner or nearer? Consider Acts was written by Luke, who follows Paul. The book of Acts ends with Paul under house arrest in Rome. And there the book then abruptly ends. Okay? This indicates that Paul was still alive when the book ends. This is very important. I'm, I'm teaching you how to te think critically for a moment. When the book of Acts ends, Paul is still alive. Okay? Paul died in 64 or 67 AD. Reasonably assuming it ends before Paul's death, Luke... Uh, in writing Acts, would have finished at around 62 A.D. Now, we can move backwards. Okay, Book of Luke ends before Paul's death. So it ends, it was probably finished before 62 A.D. Now let's move backwards. Uh, Acts is the second book of a two-part work. What's the first work? Luke. The Gospel of Luke. It was written first. And since Luke incorporates parts of Mark, Luke quotes from Mark's Gospel. Okay, check this out. Here we have Acts is written. We can nail it down with certainty that it's around 62 A.D. When did Jesus die? 33. So we're within 30 years. But it's a two-part work. So his first book, even closer to Jesus, are you with me? But yet it quotes from Mark. That means Mark was in existence even before that. Are you following this? Since Luke incorporates parts of Mark, that means that Mark is even earlier than that. If you allow a year between each gospel... And Mark is probably written no later than 60 A.D. or even the early 50s. And Jesus died around 30 A.D. or 33 A.D. Then we close the gap to 30 years or even less. And compared to other documents in, in history, this is like a news flash. We're, we just closed the gap from 400 years down to 30 years. This is a news flash. Does this make sense? But is this the earliest writings that we have of Jesus? The answer is overwhelmingly no. What is the earliest writings in the fundamental beliefs and works of Christ? In his atonement, the resurrection, and his unique association with God. Remember, the New Testament books are not written in chronological order. 
Paul's writings were before the Gospels. Paul most likely began his ministry in the late 40s. So let's say 45. Well, let's say, for, yeah, 45. How many years between 33 and 45? You're about 12 years. Hmm. Well, I would bet so too, and we're going to see here, here in just a second. Most of his major letters appeared in the 50s. To find the oldest information, you need to go to Paul's writings and see if there are any signs to indicate earlier writings. And the answer is yes. Paul included, listen to this, guys, creeds, confessions of faith, and hymns of the earliest Christian churches that go all the way back to the dawning of the church immediately after the resurrection. Instances like Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11, that's the one that we read last Sunday, where every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Right? Remember that? That was not Paul just writing something. He was transmitting and communicating to the church in Philippi something that he had just received from Jerusalem. What is this? It's a creed. It's a hymn. It's a song. This is the declaration of their faith. So was it written down? The answer was yes. It was passed on to him. All right. And also you can find in Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 20 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul passes along not only oral traditions that are, quote, fixed in fixed form. He says things like, for what I received... I passed on to you and from the scriptures and appeared to. These are very unique terminology. In other words, he's saying, I'm telling you what was been told to me. Paul's earliest writings, he's saying there's earlier writings than mine. If the crucifixion was as early as 30 AD, Paul's conversion was about two years later. So around... 30 AD, um, 30, 33 AD, 32 AD, somewhere in there, uh, if Jesus died at 30, if, if he died at 33 AD, then Paul would have been about 35 AD. Okay, are we clear? About two years later, then Paul goes to Damascus, and then he meets the apostles another two years after that. At some point during this time frame, between 35 and 37 A.D., Paul is being given by the church these creeds about Jesus. Does this make sense? Paul is given these creeds, which is already in, as he says, in fixed form and being passed along and used in the early churches. So then these creeds and traditions of faith and hymns, along with a list of detailed names that go all the way back to within two to five years of the events that happened themselves completely changes everything. A good case can be made that Christian belief in Jesus, though not, not necessarily written down completely, can be dated to within two years of the events themselves. Why is that important? Because that just validated the entire New Testament. It literally happened immediately. Immediately. They started telling about what Jesus just did. They'd not only told about it, but they wrote it down so that others in far off lands could hear the good news. Why is this relevant? Why do we believe in the scriptures? Because it literally happened. And they literally recorded it. And everybody that was there, none of them said, no, this is, this is the, the fish was only this big, bro. Not this big. Like Jesus didn't walk on water. He was walking on rocks that you couldn't see under the surface. No, people saw it. And they knew. That's the difference. We're out of time, guys. I hope this is helpful. This is, we're, we're continuing slowly. We're moving along, bite by bite, portion by portion. We're learning. Is our New Testament valid? Overwhelmingly, the answer is yes. All right, we'll talk more about this next week. God bless you.